So how do you create a brand that truly represents who you are and the products you sell, as well as building a business that you can scale online? That is what this podcast will help you do. My name is Henry Kaminsky Jr. and welcome to the Brand Doctor Podcast. Let me just make this statement loud and clear. Church is here. Church is here. Church is here. What is shaking, everybody? Welcome to another Brand Doctor podcast episode. Today, we have an amazing guest, guys. Get ready for this one. This one's going to be jam-packed. He is the founder of Known Unknown. He is the former VP of Global Design for the Coca-Cola Company. He's led programs for Coke, like the Coke Bottle 100-Year Celebration, the Taste the Feeling Campaign. He's successfully branded Diet Coke, Sprite, Fanta, Minute Maid, Fair Life, Fuse Tea, Powerade, Dasani Water, and that's just a couple of them. So he's part of he's also part of the Prince's Trust alumni, fellow and patron, and has act, actively been involved with that for almost 35 years. And today we're going to be talking about two things tomorrow's brands are going to need in order to survive the future. So without further ado, I want to introduce my man, James Somerville, to the show. Henry, thank you. Good morning. This is awesome. One, two, three, let's go. Let's rock and roll, right? So I want to get a little bit of a backstory first. So I love I love these kind of stories because I have one that's pretty similar. But you launched your first design agency in 1986 out of your grandmother's attic bedroom and you so and you and you had to name it attic which i thought was brilliant talk to me about the day you got bit by the design bug and 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 walk me through how you got that going and to where you're at today yeah i think as a young man i was uh, not super academic at school um but i could draw and i could doodle that was my thing. I got in trouble for doodling um, most of the time. But eventually, you know, coming through the high school, there was only one route for me, which was a, an art college course. And, and following that, in the mid 80s in the UK, there was a high level of unemployment, especially for young people. We know how difficult it is today for young people. But even back then, you know, um, so, so we uh, accidentally fell into this idea of why don't we start an agency? Um, no experience, no money, no clients, and no no office until my grandmother, um, she said, hey, why don't you use my attic bedroom? So that's kind of how it started. It was almost through circumstances than, than strategy. Um, and, uh, and we figured it would last a year, but it, it kind of lasted 25 years. <laughs> and how fast does 25 years go, right? Oh, wow. I mean, it feels like yesterday. Um, and at the time, we were we were street artists, myself and my partner, Simon, we were chalking. You've seen those guys who are like doing artwork on the on the on the on the concrete. And, and so we did that as a, as a teen. And, you know, we realized after three years of rubbing the, the, the streets with chalk, um, we, we literally had no fingerprints. Um, and there's a lot a young man can do at 18 with no fingerprints, but we figured no, that's not that's not the that's not the route we're going to take. Uh, we're going to come indoors and make try and make it work. I love it. I love it. Well, talk to me how you got into um, the Prince's Trust. That's real. That's a really cool. That's a really cool part of your story. Yeah, I mean it's a it, it's such an important uh, kind of chapter, where, and still it ran the entire. Uh, 25 years. So in the very beginning, with no clients and no investment, all the banks, uh, all the high street banks, the lenders said no. Bear in mind, we'd just fallen out of art school. So we were kind of looking a little, you know, um, you know, punkish, if you like. And so we weren't really kind of like the business type. So no wonder those more commercial lenders said no. But the Prince's Trust, which was started in the 70s by His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, uh, was there to help um, kind of young people who and give them a give them a, a first step, 
And they they looked at uh, our, our business plan, which quite honestly was on a single sheet of paper, um, and said, you know what, we're going to give you guys a chance. Um, we believe in you. And so they awarded us £2,000, British pounds. Uh, for us, that was our kind of seed capital. From there, uh, we invested in Apple early. It was a, an emerging technology. No one heard of it. And we had to go 300 miles to print from a, a floppy disk because no one around us printed from Apple. So it was it was that very early stage. But without the Prince's Trust, without that £2,000, we, we may not be sat here today. Wow. Isn't it like the littlest things, like those compelling events that happen in your life? Talk about branding, right? Those compelling events that happen in your life that could completely change your future, completely change it. That's yeah, awesome. and quite often you don't know they're coming, right? You don't plan for we we don't plan we don't plan for COVID. We don't plan for these kind of things in life that 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 force us to think differently. And back then, you know, there was other there were other things. Uh, thankfully, not on the scale of COVID, but there were things in my small world that just kind of like you know uh, came along, and I didn't see it coming. But you you know you you react uh, and, and you change that. But you're right, the small things can have a big, a big, and, and we try to think big, you know, we're young men, we're 19, we're naive, we didn't go to formal business school, but like anybody else at that age, we had, we had big plans and big, big dreams and tried to think big. That was our, that was our thing at the time. And look what happened. <laughs> look what happened. Right. It definitely worked out. So today we're going to be talking about the two things that tomorrow's brands need to be doing in order to survive in the future. And we're going to get deep into that right after this quick little message. If you're a business owner who feels your branding isn't truly representing the value that you deliver, check out this free video training that will help you level up your brand's messaging and online presence so that you can start attracting higher quality clients. Visit with a Z at the end, not an S, dot net backslash level up my branding. All right, James, the floor is yours. Let's get into this topic of conversation because I know there's a lot of listeners out there and viewers that want this to be uncovered so that they know what to do from a branding perspective to help them survive. That's awesome. Well, I think, you know, when I look at, I've had, I've, I've been blessed in my career to work for small brands, startups, medium sized, global brands. And whilst their business, their product, their service, their market, their culture is all different, I try and join the dots and what makes a successful brand. Of course, a hundred year old brand um, has going kind of, we've seen that kind of rise of those giants, but yet but yet a brand that is only a year old, um, only two years old, is really coming through with with uh, with their own voice. Um, so several things that I've I've observed, and I think one of the it goes back to us all being young. Imagine we're all six year olds. Imagine we're we're with our parents, and you know that that magical time where that we maybe we can't remember. But really, one of the biggest things that I've learned is is around storytelling, and people more than ever ever right now want to believe in in something, want to be told a story. So if brands just push push on a on a product and a message and a sale. I, I don't think as consumers now we want to be over, we don't want to be sold to, we're, we're, we're impatient. Um, we're, we're very emotional and COVID has kind of like maybe exaggerated that need to be more human. But I think those stories, if they're authentic and they're real and we believe them, and you could be the biggest brand in the world or, or a small startup. So number one for me is around storytelling. It has to be true. It has to be authentic, believable. And that's a great way of bringing people into your conversation and starting to move it to a more emotional level. Very interesting. So I want to, I want to discuss this, especially with you, because I really value your, your point of view on this. So you and I spend quite a bit of time on Clubhouse. We've shared many stages together. Mm -hmm. And I hear... Very often, I don't know if you catch this, but I hear very often 
a lot of the folks saying, you know, I hate the word authenticity. Mm -hmm. You know, I hate the word authenticity. Oh, the authenticity word again. And I want to know, like, why? I guess I have to ask them. But people are, 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 are trying. I don't know. They're making the word authenticity a bad thing. But I got to tell you, a couple years ago, I went to Ad Week in, in New York City because I live 45 minutes away. And I spent three days there. And all the big, big brands were there. And the word that was most frequently used was authenticity. So I want to know, why is authenticity getting such a bad rap? Like, why do people hate on the word authenticity? Because it's the one thing that's going to drive your brand and, and, and drive that connection and experience. So I would love to get your take on this. Yeah, I think there's, there should be a do, don't say kind of like a T-shirt design. Uh, it reminds me of a word maybe in the last five years, 10 years around innovation. There wasn't a company in the word that wasn't throwing that around the C-suite, throwing that around the organization, the culture. It became an overused word. Um, so I, I think, you know, innovate, don't talk about it. Just do that. Um, that you know, in terms of being authentic, just be real. Don't tell people you're real. Don't tell people you're authentic. Act like that. Because if you have to tell people, then there's a level of kind of like, that's not, that doesn't feel so authentic or real to me if you have to tell me. Um, so, so, so there's a, a do, don't say um, around it. And, and you're right. It's coming up a lot in, in Clubhouse and people are talking about how do you, how do you be authentic? But, you know, like you said, you know, this is like two dudes in a pub having a chat. That's as authentic as it gets. Two friends having a coffee, two people going on a road trip or three people or five people. That's as real as it gets. They don't have to tell each other they're being authentic. They just are. So I think there's a, you know, when the when it comes up in discussion, it, it gets a bad rap. I think, I think if people can just act that way rather than say we are, we are an authentic brand, that that that's that's a disaster. Um, you know, but if they act that way, people will draw their own conclusion and realize that that brand, that voice, that narrative just feels real. So let me ask you this, James, <clears throat> is there anything that we can share with the audience other than saying, just be you, right? To help them sort of showcase their expertise. Like I have a couple of ideas, but I wanted to ask you first, is there any exercises or practices that they can do to bring out that authenticity? I hope yeah. that was, a, I hope that was clean. <laughs> Totally. Um, okay. m products and brands and marketeers, they, we, we, we push out the finished, let's call it the finished ad, the finished post, the finished product, the rendered, beautiful. Um, and that's fine because that's ultimately maybe what the, where, the, where the transaction is, where the sale is. What I also navigate towards, and if it's carefully done, is the behind the scenes, the BTS, the process. Um, so let's take a, a, a small business. It could be a restaurant. It could be somebody who's kind of creating something by hand. All, all that imagery um, of, the, of, the, of the craft, of the building of the product, of the internal meetings and discussing. Sure, the end product is what we will buy and maybe put our credit card in because we'd like that product in our life. But there's the story. Um, that leads you to that end product. So in terms of authentic and, and telling stories, the behind the scenes, if it's carefully curated and not just kind of like a random collection of photographs that nobody really understands, you've got to see it as a journey. Um, but ultimately, I think people also want to know what is behind this brand? What is behind this product? Who are the people? Do I believe in it? Does it have a purpose? Uh, does it fit into my life? Does it reflect my values? And I think that's a really important. So if there are 10 posts on Instagram, maybe five of them are behind the scenes telling the story of the product before it uh, arrives at a, as a final state. I think people jump to the end quickly because we've been taught that. You know, we buy products, so here it is. I think I think uh, peeling that back can be a very powerful, powerful way of engaging. Oh yeah, I, I I totally agree. I think that will allow you to 
create those tentacles like you meant like you didn't say it in this fashion but like these tentacles that people could grab onto i talk about that all the time when you share vulnerabilities when you share stories when you share the good the bad the ugly those are just tentacles that you're putting out into the world that people can actually grab onto and reel themselves in if they want closer to the brand if you're just showing them the fancy or if you're just showing them the end result like everybody else is uh what do they call it on instagram like it's everybody's sizzle reel they don't show the 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 ugly or the uh the reality the 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 tough times the 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 struggles right the beatings you know, I, I learned that early from interviewing and, and hiring so many uh, great designers around the world that have worked for me or we've contracted with. And, I, you know, and they'll, they'll show their portfolio because that's like that's that's kind of the way it's done. Right. I will dig into each piece of work and tell me, how did you get to that logo? How did you get to that identity packaging? You know, whatever that may be. Tell me, show me the sketchbook. Show me the, the pencil sketch before the finished icon, you know, which looks like a logo. To me, that's more interesting. That tells me about her journey or his story. And I think we're all looking at brands in a similar way today because that's what we're looking to buy into. That journey is so important. And then, sure, great logo. I love it. But actually, there's a bigger story there. Mm, that's fantastic. I love that. I love that. I love that. So... The, the first thing that we need to do is embrace and lean into storytelling, not just say we're authentic, but be authentic. And you gave some really great ideas behind the scenes and so on. What is the number two thing that brands of tomorrow need to start to do, or if not, they're already doing, continue to do in order to keep moving forward? Well, I think also look at the communication as a journey. Um, people, okay, so let's take a billboard. A billboard, great. We're driving to the airport when we used to fly, but uh, we're seeing all this kind of communication out on the street. Uh, there has to be a tactical journey from that billboard or that t television commercial or something that we've seen on online all the way through, if you like, the funnel to the product itself. And a great example and a great lesson I learned, you know, whilst, whilst I'm in my role at Coca-Cola was, there was always something about the billboard, and we've all seen Coke billboards, and they're, you know, they're, they're usually kind of like, you know, uh, the ones that we were working on, they've got that, like these young young people hanging out, drinking Coke. And and the the strategy that I was kind of taking away and the way that we, uh, we thought about that in, in terms of the, that's like an awareness. Um, you know, you look at that billboard and think, see these kind of, you know, millennials hanging out, having Coke, and I think to myself, yeah, I used to be, I used to be cool like that. You know, so as a as a as a fifty year old, I can look down at it and I can say, yeah, I can relate to that because I was young once and and hanging out like that. The younger teenagers, the 12, 13, 14 year olds, can look up and go, wow, yeah, that's the crowd I want to be in. So you go from like I love Coke, and then study it next time. Take a big brand doesn't need to be Coke, but study it as you get to the airport, as you get to the stores, you're looking for a beverage. The communication changes. You go from I love Coke to I want to cook because you're in front of the cooler and the intrinsics get dialed up as we would call it the ice the refreshment cues because at that point you're looking to make a choice in 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 this instance in a cooler it's maybe lunchtime you're thirsty okay which beverage do i go for so you go from i love the brand to i want the brand and so that change of mindset that can be in a matter of minutes as a consumer you can be outside the airport and inside the airport so think of that. That journey is really important. How do you want people to kind of engage uh, at certain points and then transact? And I see quite often people are posting the same thing everywhere. Like, okay, I'm, I'm lost. I'm not sure on the journey where I'm meant to be. So try and kind of articulate and strategically map out that journey. And I think that can really help people understand that we, we, we just don't want more images bombarded. We want to go on that journey and then I'm willing to kind of like make the sale or, or engage in the sale, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. And, and I, I preach this because this is the power of a marketing and sales funnel from a from a technical standpoint. So my company does a lot of that architecture and build out using the ClickFunnels platform and what we preach to our clients is the funnel is like the guardrails 
that keep your clients going in the direction that you want them to go. So when you have that funnel in place and, and you, you touched upon it through the communication and looking at the billboards, like when you have them on rails, they go faster. They, they, they're not distracted and you're guiding them every step of the way, whether it be through emails, whether it be through landing pages, whether it be through videos. But to your point before you mentioned, it's not just a hodgepodge of, of randomness. It's things need to be in sequence. Things need to be intentional. Very, very important stuff when it comes to building your brand. The next question, and I'm sure you get this a lot, but we'll get into some fun questions in a second, but I don't know why I haven't had the chance to ask you this. There's so many there's so many definitions of branding and mm -hmm. what would be your definition? What, what definition did you hear that you've sort of gravitated to and said, this is, or did you create your own? What is brand to you? What is branding to you? Yeah. I mean, again, let's go back to, you know, I, I, part of my, you know, fa family or a member of my family had a farm. So let's look at those sheep and how they got branded. Right. It's a mark in a way. It's a mark of, Kind of like a uh, an identifier if you like it's to say you know but obviously today i think it's something that is either worn eaten consumed hanging on my wall in my bathroom i shampoo blah 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 so branding is something that i believe that you you know i want it to be part of my life as a product i mean i'll, I'll go back let's use shampoo that's going to be in my bathroom for and you know, obviously, I don't shampoo every day like other people, but it's <laughs> a either. it's a product that's going to be in my bathroom next to the sink or in the shower for maybe a month, maybe six weeks. You know, so that is the part of my life. It could be in the kitchen, it could be in the garage, it could be in my wardrobe. So branding is something which is an extension of my DNA. So I like to find things. Firstly, it starts with the product. The product has to be good. So let's not candy coat something that the that, 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 well, let's start with the product, but assuming the product is good, does the articulation of that product, does the shape, the form, the color, the materials, the way it's packaged, the way it shows up, does it reflect my life? Do I want it in my bathroom, my kitchen, my car, or on myself? So that's the layer really that people you know, have to engage with. So we're assuming the product is great, but does the, does, does the packaging around that, the identity around that uh, fit into my life? Um, and when people come in my life, they might comment on that. They may say, hey, that's cool. Where's that? Where's that from? And why do you wear that? And that, that looks great or not. But certainly that's, that's maybe something that I start with is, is it suitable? Is it something that is it solving a problem in my life? Do I need that shampoo right now? Um, and I think that's something that people often forget. What is the problem that you're trying to solve? Um, and can you identify then the consumer or the customer that would be willing to buy that and accept that in their life as well? Beautiful stuff. Beautiful stuff. So we're doing pretty good with time here, James. So I'm going to get into some fun stuff. Okay. So these, these questions may not have anything to do with brand, but it'll definitely keep the conversation flowing nicely. And we'll get some chuckles out of it too, I bet. So, Here's a question. Which activities in your life right now literally make you lose track of time? Good one. Um, I, I go, I, I keep active. I think mental state, wellness, you know, those types of things are, you know, such an important ingredient for creativity on entrepreneurship and branding. So I run, I listen to music that I, I, I can come back and write down several ideas just from that. So for me, that's almost kind of like a reset. And we touched on that yesterday on the, on the, on a clubhouse is resetting. Um, so I love to do that. And I sometimes think, wow, where did that go? Uh, wasn't even thinking about it. So that's one, uh, doodling, doodling on something that is just, you know, takes me to another place. Um, I'm not sure what the exact stats are, but I'm sure we are bombarded with, 20,000 messages a day, visuals and, and messages and, and interruptions. So for me, it's all going in. And for all of us, it's going in. I, I tend to filter I filter through those by uh, doodling on, on a piece of paper, doodling on the back of an envelope, doodling something, and I kind of lose a little bit of time doing that. But the end of it is there may be an idea. 
There may be just a, a thought or something you want to call someone about, reach out. And I kind of lose a little bit of time with that, but it's an enjoyable loss of time, not a, hey, where did that go? I need to catch up. Awesome. 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 Yeah. Talk about, talk about staying creative, staying flow, staying, staying in that flow and, and, and being mentally and physically present and, and active, you know, unfortunately, you know, when my, when towards the last years of my mother's life, she gave up on walking and her legs basically atrophied and she lost walking. Like she couldn't walk anymore. And we had to, we had to wheel her all around and, and that's why I'm out here. I'm 40, but I'm out there every single day walking, getting up after every hour. And because it's in my head, like if you, if you don't use it, you lose it. And so that, that's, that's, that's some great stuff. That's some great stuff. Okay. Another question. What's one thing you don't mind sharing with people? Um, I don't mind sharing the process. I don't mind sharing, you know, people might say, uh, okay, let's say I design uh, a logo uh, in 30 minutes. And someone will say, well, you know, how did you get there in 30 minutes? Well, it took me 30 years to know how to do it in 30 minutes. But, and I don't mind sharing that because I think it's important. We have a, we have a responsibility to everybody. I think it's important that we know, we all know so much. Um, and that we pass that, we share that. Uh, there's no secrets. I mean, I think there's, you know, in theory, there's enough work to go around. I used to be in a very competitive agency landscape. Uh, and then I went to the client side. I call myself uh, poacher turned gamekeeper. And I saw it from the other side of the table. And then I kind of went back out again. And I realized then at that second pass of being in the, in the you know, com competition is good, but collaboration is stronger. And, and we can all win from that. So I don't mind sharing that process of how I got from A to B. I think it's my responsibility to help educate the next generation because um, we're only passing through. So that that's one thing I'm really passionate around. Certainly now in my kind of like third chapter of my career, if you want to call it like that, but maybe not as a younger person, I was a little bit more like, you know, hey, we need to win, we need to do that. But But certainly I think sharing your process, sharing your skills, it's a great thing to pass on. It's not a product. It doesn't appear on a shelf, but it's just your mind and what you know. I love that you mentioned that because I, I share that a lot with the folks that I interact with and, and clients because they're they're very, I can't show them this, that I'm, I'm breeding the competition or, right? And I say to myself, I used to be like that. But what, what one of my mentors said to me once was, Henry, nobody's going to do it like you. Nobody. There's only one of you in this world. They may come close. They may, they may mirror some things or maybe some tactics or whatnot, but they're never going to be able to do it like you. And to your point, like as I get older, you get more mature and you, 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 you start to, you start to appreciate the process a lot more. And, and you want to help those other folks. You want to show them, but, we know now being in the in the careers that we've been in for multiple years and decades we know that listen you can you can you could try all you want but it's not going to come out the same way james did it it's not going to come out the same way henry did it there's going to be a a, a a a tad difference and that's that's the best part about the whole project <laughs> it's the Absolutely. best part it makes it unique it makes it you so that's awesome that's awesome. All right. I'll show, so you, I'll show you a quick piece of uh, uh, packaging I did for, for Coke. Uh, we call this the love can, and I lobbied the, the legal team um, over the course of a week to allow to, to ask them to allow me to do this. And what it is is just this idea that, okay, it's the first time that the Coca-Cola script has ever been used by the company in a way that does not say Coca-Cola. But everybody knows who that is. Um, and no one's going to copy that. And so it's just a great example of an iconic brand uh, being brave like that, showing a little bit of vulnerability of not having their logo on there, um, but but replacing it with a word that reflects their values and is timeless. Who doesn't want love in their life? So that kind of th that thing, I think, can be a personal thing or a brand thing as well. Is showing that openness and that willing willingness to try something new and share that with the world. 
Mm. Such a great point. Such a great point. Now, here's another question. Mm -hmm. In what way are you too hard on yourself? I think many entrepreneurs possibly could relate to this, many creatives. Uh, I often think, uh, have I done enough today? Have I achieved what I set out to do this week, this month, this year? And so my I set my expectations as high as the top of Everest. I really do. And that's kind of a, you know, it's it's both a blessing and a curse because it drives me, but at the same time, I never truly get to the summit. I never, in my own mind, you know, it's just kind of an inner burning kind of uh, feeling more than anything. Of course, I feel I feel content. I feel, uh, uh, you know, I've, I've achieved things with myself and my family. But at the same time, there's always, you know, I used to hear that expression. Um, he's at the top of his game. She's at the top of her game. I think, no, they're not. There's always another inch. There's always another yard or another mile. And so that can also weigh me down as well because I'm constantly so, you know, there is a little bit of that in all of us, I expect, certainly from an entrepreneur side and, a, and, a, and maybe a creative side. I always think that, no, that could, it could be better. We could do something at the next level. So that pushing, pushing is, uh, but also on the flip side, I enjoy that. Uh, you know, that's kind of part of my, just part of my DNA, I guess. You're not alone, James. <laughs> I am the same way every right. single day. Right. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Oh, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Here's another fun question. <laughs> What's one thing you're doing right now mm -hmm. in your life that you never thought you would do? G great question. I am about to enter... Uh, <laughs> A field, and we're all we're all uh, kind of uh, see um, platforms and tech startups and blah blah blah. I'm not that guy. I am from a a, a branding uh, identity kind of like if you think about Coca Cola, that's definitely more. Although it was end to end, but more in the kind of a, a communication world. And I'm about to launch a kind of a, a niche but important platform as a kind of like a very um, you know trial and error step tech startup. Have I ever done that before? No. Am I from that background? No. Am I an engineer, uh, a UX designer? No. But that actually excites me. That actually makes me think, well, that's why I'm going to do it. And there's a purpose behind it too, in terms of the community. But certainly as a field, as a swim lane, that's not, that's not my swim lane. But that also drives me again. Henry, that makes it, that makes it exciting. Um, you know, for me. So that's what I'm working on at the moment. And I'm just about to embark on that new challenge. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that, that's not where I'm from. So there's an element of fear, good fear, uh, that's coming along with it as well. Awesome. Awesome. And I want to talk about that in a second. I got one more fun question and then we'll get, I want to talk about, um, known unknown or is it unknown known? Unknown. It's known. Known. unknown. Yeah. Known, unknown. Yeah. That's my, that's my dyslexia kicking in. Last question. Do you make a pro and con list or do you go with your gut? Uh, I don't formally write down. I know that's a process and methodology that works for, for many, many people. And, and I tend to, um, I tend to maybe think it through, but I, I would probably, I, I could probably, for myself, sometimes it's not right, but I arrive at a situation quite quickly. I used to use this little formula that someone told me around about 98, 99, 2000. So it's a little old school, but it was the four Fs. Um, is this going to move you forward? Are you going to move forward as a business or, or as an individual? Uh, so F number one, forward. Uh, is it financially viable? You know, basically, will that will that uh, result in something that actually you can you can stand on and build a business around? Um, the third one is an old-fashioned word now is fame, but in social media terms, will people talk about it? Will they share it, like it, repost it? So has it got a word of mouth value? And then the fourth one is fun. Do you feel you're going to have fun with this? So those four Fs. I look for those four Fs, and if you you can't tell going into everything. But certainly if you get one, two, three, four in your mind very quickly, 
It'll move me forward. It will be financially viable. It looks really fun. And I'm, and I'm sure if I do this, people are going to talk about it. That's a home run. If, if I'm not hitting all those quickly in my head, I have to question whether to be involved. Mm, I love that. That's the first time I ever heard that. And there's so many, so many different, uh, you know, frameworks out there. That's the but, first one. That's the first time I ever heard that. That's awesome. Yeah, That's there's awesome. a fifth, there, but I won't use that on this show. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> yes, it's family, right? The family. Family. Right. That's the one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> James, real quick, with the with with some time that we have left, talk to us about known unknown and what that is. Because I know that's what you're currently working on now. And and I want to shed some light to it and I want to get some people um interested in it. So talk to us about that. Well, there, there's so many communities now that we can all be part of. And let's take the big guns, you know, the, the Facebook and the LinkedIn, and, and they're all great. We're all out there. Uh, and even and Clubhouse. What I felt uh, when I left Coca-Cola in 2018, I wanted to kind of create less of a creative agency because I did that. And that's kind of a tried and tested model. But I didn't want to be brick and mortar. I wanted to create a community of the, the best, what I would perceive as the best talent in the world. Um, no hiring, no firing, just accessing them on demand for clients, for, for, for businesses. And so in 2018, it was a kind of like I was trying to sell this model in of this virtual distributed blah, blah, blah. And clients were looking at me and going like, what? Where's your office in New York? Where's your office in London? How many people do you employ? Zero. So um, then along came COVID. And we're all distributed and we're all kind of doing this now. And we can tap into anyone. And we've got side hustlers and moonlighters who have got holding down full-time jobs. So for me now, the community of the, these creatives around the world that I've managed to build up, I want to formalize that into a real online community that taps into Slack or Discord or Clubhouse. So we meet in these places that are already there. I'm not looking to reinvent the wheel, but I am looking to gather the, the, the brightest, the best. My oldest is in his late 70s. My youngest is a teenager. So it's a multiple, multidisciplined, all, all countries in the world, all ages, all creative disciplines. I want to help them grow. Um, I, want the, I want the late 70 year old to learn and do a collaboration with the 18 year old. And I think that part of it is really important to me. And sure, we'll engage them with projects and great briefs, but really the coming together, sharing, collaborating, maybe even kind of engaging commercially, maybe selling, you know, let's sell those. <laughs> Who's got an NFT right now? You know, let's jump. Let's look at that. Let's look at that. And so for me, but it's a very much a vertical uh, rather than I think LinkedIn is like, you know, fantastic. And but it's like a Walmart, right? I don't want to go to Walmart every day. Sometimes I want to go to a place where my people hang out. Uh, so look at it like that uh, from a creative perspective. And we've called it known unknown because we all know so much. Whether you're 18 or 78, you know so much. But we're lifelong learners. So there's so much we don't know. So everybody can contribute and everybody can learn from other people as well. So that's the idea behind it, Henry. Uh, very much in the creative space, but uh, I'm at the start of that journey right now. I love it. I love it. I love it. I want to know why this is such a passion project for you. Well, it's interesting coming from the agency world, coming from the um, then it, then through Coca Cola, and I realized that you know we we were all so siloed twelve months ago. We went to an office, we went to a studio, we went to a corporation, we went to our stores, and that that works because that's life. I think this is a much more um, tight. Well, clearly now we're all working in different ways, but. The future, the next decade is exciting to me because we can tap into people that we wouldn't ordinarily have spoken to because we're wired to go to the office or the studio or the store, wherever we may work. Now, just think of what's opening up. Just think of the next 10 years and how we can be working in a much more fluid, collaborative way. That really excites me. Um, you know, because we, we've we've done I've done my 30, 40, almost 40 years of like working from a young teenage entrepreneur through now. But it was very much siloed. It was very much in a box, mm -hmm. wherever that box may have been. And like all of a sudden now that box has disappeared. So I'm excited about that next chapter, that next decade of how we will work and how we will pass that on 
to the next rock stars of our industry who are coming through school right now, who are being educated at uh, primary or, or, or junior or high school right now and give them something to uh, a platform that they can work towards as well. So that's really why I'm, I'm fired up around this. Mm, that's fantastic. Last question. And, I, and it's a great question to end the show is what do you want? What do you want to leave behind as your legacy? I'll go all the way back to the Prince's Trust. Um, so the Prince's Trust, since His Royal Highness started the charity in the late 70s, have helped a million young people in the UK. So I've been asked and I'm honored now as an alumni and a, and a, and a, and a patron to help launch the Prince's Trust America, for example, to help expand that brand, that charity, but to help people here, to help young people here. Uh, in the US, where I live right now. In, I live in Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, whilst I have a, a an emotional connection to, to the original Prince's Trust, I'm also really fueled by maybe expanding that brand, His Royal Highness's brand, if you like. And I think the next million young people, wherever they may be, and that's not a creative, they could be entrepreneurs and looking for mentorship and training and starting their own business in any field. Um, if I could help do that in the next 10 years, and it took him 40 years to hit a million, we think we could hit a million in the next decade or even less. I, I'd be very, very pleased. And I could probably like, you know, look back on that as, as, as not just a design project I've left behind, but something more meaningful. Um, so that's, that's something aside from my business model and my commercial world that I'd really, I'm really spending some time on and I'd love to be able to, uh, look back in a decade, maybe come back on your show in 10 years, Henry, and see how I've done. We will be here. I can promise you we will be here, man. What a beautiful conversation. I am so happy that I reached out to you and and asked you. I was I was toying around with it for a couple of weeks and I said, you know what? It was a Sunday. It was last Sunday. And I said, I am reaching out to him. What's the worst he's going to tell me? No. And you were so responsive and you were so open. That's one thing I love about you, James. Like you have a beautiful pedigree and you you're you're you have look at that, look at that resume, right? But you're so approachable. And, and I think that's something that Clubhouse is, is witnessing when you come on and, and, and you get put on stage. And, and what I am experiencing now personally with you, you were so approachable. You're so happy to come on and you were – the, you were so excited and you could tell through the emails like I'm so <laughs> not, I'm not throwing you under the bus. I'm thinking this is this is a fantastic character trait that people of your caliber should have. I wish everybody of your caliber had that same personality and, and characteristic, but they don't. And that's OK. It is what it is. But I just wanted to say thank you so much for spending 42 minutes with us today. We usually go like 30 minutes tops and you went the extra with us. And so thank you so much for that. And I look forward to collaborating with you more uh, on helping you get the word out uh, with your endeavors and sharing the stages with you on Clubhouse. And let's let's together make this world a better place. And so with that said, where can people learn more about you? Where could they follow your journey? Where can we send our listeners today? Great. Thank you, Henry. And, and, and just to say, you said at the beginning, this is going to be like two guys in a pub. And I look forward to that real clinking of a cold beer with you. Um, I'm ready. Great. Yeah. But in, in terms of if people want to contact me, obviously, whether it's LinkedIn and Instagram and Clubhouse, those are the, those are the go-to channels. But as a website, knownunknown.co. Um, that's uh, that's CEO, of course. Uh, that's where, if you're a creative, that's where we're looking to for people to maybe just sign up, engage. Uh, we're 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 starting small, but uh, we will engage with with you if you have the time and you would like to be part of what we're doing. Come and see us. Um, but then on the more visual side, of course, Instagram and LinkedIn, and and I'll reach back out to anybody who's interested. So thank you for that plug, Henry. That's awesome. You're very very welcome, James Somerville. Thank you so much again for spending your time with us. I'm going to wrap up the show, but don't go anywhere. I want to talk to you backstage real quick before we wrap up. Guys, hope you got your notepad out today and took some notes. James definitely highlighted some very, very important pieces of branding 
that you're going to need in order to survive in the future. Storytelling, being authentic, things like that. Super important. Don't poo-poo on the word authentic. It's the one thing that's going to help you connect and drive experience with your ideal clients. They want the real you. This world is starving for the truth. And it's up to us to give it to them. So have an amazing day, guys, and I'll catch you on the next episode real soon. Take care. Bye-bye.